uh, called Indra's net, which I've always found intriguing. And according to Hindu philosophy, there is a net that is cast across the breadth and length of the entire universe. And in each juncture of this net, there is a jewel. And if you look deeply into any one jewel, you will see reflected in it every other jewel in the universe. And this is a metaphor, and it means that if you go into anything passionately and deeply, you will eventually come to see talents expressed from within you that you didn't know you had. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I, dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW in the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. I'm currently drinking an unsafe quantity of coffee but kicking the day off bright and early at 6.30 this morning to bring you my number one priority for the day, which is your next podcast. This podcast is my mission to help you optimize health, business, and lifestyle by interviewing the most effective people around today, whether that be zero carb, world record holders, health and fitness giants, high intensity training specialists, athletes, sports scientists, highly successful business owners, life hackers, finance experts, etc., etc. My next guest is the one and only John Little, who joins me for a part two. John's been asked to come back on the show more than any other guest. His first episode on Corporate Warrior was incredibly popular, and I am confident this will be the same and that you will not be disappointed. John is a prolific writer and publisher in exercise and philosophy. He's the co-author of the very popular book, Body by Science, which he wrote alongside Dr. Doug McGuff. He's written for Muscle and Fitness, co-authored and published a large number of popular strength training and exercise books, including static contraction training, uh, power facts training, and the golfer's two-minute workout. On another note, John is considered one of the world's most foremost authorities on Bruce Lee. He's the only person authorized to review the entirety of Lee's personal notes, sketches, and reading annotations to edit books on the subject of Bruce Lee's martial art and its far-reaching philosophical underpinnings. John Little has also devoted much effort to popularizing the works of philosopher and historian Will Durant in the 21st century. He founded and heads the Will Durant Foundation, which is an effort to keep Durant's ideas and thoughts alive in the modern era. In this episode, we cover a lot of stuff around exercise and high intensity training. I try and weave your questions in where I can um, and really try and get some good um, information from John on his latest views in this field. So we talk about things like exercise frequency in response to the research discussed on my podcast with uh, Dr. James Steele. Uh, We talk about John's most up-to-date views on high-intensity training, the changes he's made to the Big Five Protocol, the importance of changing a workout routine and how and when to do so, and the problems when people say, I did X routine and gained X muscle, and when I moved to doing X, I lost it all, (laughs) or didn't get as good results. And we also talk about John's current diet and thoughts around that. 
And then after that, I was really keen to talk to John about philosophy, uh, as it's something I've certainly become more interested in of late. So we talk about uh, Bruce Lee and how he would fare against a modern MMA fighter. Um, We talk about the influence that Alan Watts had on Bruce Lee, John's personal mentors, and where to begin if you want to start learning more about philosophy. And we talk about much, much more than that. So for all the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to 15minutescorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast. That's 1515 and then all spelled out minutescorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast. And at the end, don't forget to hang around for your free gift. So without further ado, please enjoy this part two with John Little. John, thank you for joining me on the Corporate Warrior podcast again. I appreciate you taking the time to come onto the show. My pleasure, Lawrence. (laughs) So as I was kind of alluding to when we were kind of uh, just chatting before we started recording, um, I had recently listened to our part one uh, the other day and really enjoyed it. And it, it, it made me laugh because... I've made a few mistakes, <laughs> so I definitely have not done a good job in ignoring, um, or oh, sorry, I, I, I accidentally ignored your advice on taking stuff on faith, because I've definitely been taking stuff on faith far too much since we spoke, um, <laughs> and also been uh, wasting time, I guess, pursuing muscle hypertrophy a little bit too obsessively. Um, and it's funny because about a month ago, I was like, oh, you know, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, you know, I kind of come to peace with the fact that I'm probably not going to put on a ton more muscle, but actually I'm very happy with the way my physique looks and I feel good and I'm quite happy with where I'm at and sort of sustaining that. Um, right. And, and I kind of come to peace with that maybe, I don't know, a few months ago, that, that recently. But then listening back to your podcast, you told me all this like two years ago yeah. and it just, well, I wouldn't say it went in one ear and out the other, but it, clearly it didn't sink in as much as it should have. Uh, which I found quite funny. Um, so I just wanted to <laughs> sort of share that with you before we got started because I thought like this time I definitely will heed your words much more. Um, <laughs> so yeah, kicking off with some questions on exercise. So recently I had um, James Steele, uh, Dr. James Steele back on the podcast um, who you know and obviously you've read some of his some of his research. Um, and he, he uh, peer-reviewed some really interesting papers recently um and he he believes that there doesn't seem to be sufficient evidence to say that one should rest for a prolonged number of days or certainly the number of days advocated by the i guess the hit community between workouts and actually he, he's he he's he's saying that the uh, most recent literature suggests or actually it does suggest and uh, that greater frequency may actually induce more muscle hypertrophy although let me caveat i appreciate that this could be incredibly marginal and almost like, you know, not really that much, not, 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 not high ROI in terms of like increasing the frequency. But I noticed that this, this paper and this viewpoint flew in the face of the, the, I guess the, the hit principles of reducing frequency to optimize muscle, optimize muscle gain. So I just really curious what your thoughts would be on that, whether you've come across that paper at all. Uh, and I guess what your immediate thoughts are when you hear me, I guess, say that. <laughs> well, I um, I can't say that I've read, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't, I haven't read that paper, but I mean, I've certainly heard similar positions in the past, and I, and I respect uh, Mr. Steele tremendously. Um, but I think the operative word in what you told me there was may induce greater amounts of hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many variables, and I think he would be the first to admit that. Um, but nowhere does that, uh, supersede the fact that you should only train as often as you need to. And while this can vary with people based upon age, uh, which is directly tied into one's potential rate of recovery, other factors such as stress, uh, anxiety, viruses, habits such as drinking and smoking, uh, which may impede, uh, somewhat the recovery process along with common factors such as sleep or lack thereof, nutrition, uh, i.e., are your cells getting the nutrients they need or are you simply eating to quell low glucose levels and thus uh, you eat processed foods that get converted to glucose rapidly, leaving the nutritional component of your diet largely ignored. And then there is the issue of genetic kappa. If you've been training for a year 
uh, you've probably noticed a difference in your physique and you've probably noticed that the gains have slowed or ceased altogether. So now it becomes a matter of diminishing returns. You cannot exceed your genetics. So how you look at this point may well be as good as it gets and training more frequently with or, or with more volume isn't going to move the goalposts further down the field for you. So why output more energy pursuing an objective that doesn't exist? I'm, uh, from my own perspective, I am more firmly a minimalist now with regards to exercise. Um, I don't know that uh, uh, the training more frequently, I mean, it, it may, I think uh, even other researchers have indicated that if, if you take two people that haven't trained before, right out of the gate and you train uh, the one individual, let's say twice a week or three times a week and the other person once a week, that coming out of the gate, the person who trains more frequently will gain at a more rapid rate. I believe it's up to about the six month period, at which point it, it arrests. And then he has to reduce his training to to recover more more firmly. And, and on and on it goes until you're down to once a week. But I think given that uh, you know, there is a genetic cap to all of this. Um, you know, tra training more often for an almost a, a negligible amount of progress, even if it were possible, you just got to weigh that up and say, is it worth it? You know, and, and to my vantage point, no, it's not. You know, I don't, I don't think you should put out 100% more uh, energy um, for a fractional, almost imperceptible amount of gain, even assuming it does exist. Again, the operative word there being may be produced. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I should actually add, and I know if James is listening to this, he'll, he'll want me to make sure that this is clear, that this study was performed on advanced trainees. So mm. um, however you – obviously that So the gains, the, the gains would be even more marginal then. But, yeah, I mean, if, oh, you're, yeah. if you're a professional bodybuilder and, you know, putting on a – micro ounce of muscle could make a discernible difference in how you're viewed by the judges and maybe it's worth pursuing. But, um, anyway, I can, I can only speak for myself and at my age, that, that really holds no interest at all. If someone told me today that I could gain a quarter of a pound of muscle, if I train seven days a week this next year, I'm not interested. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. Well, well uh, yeah, it's a point well made, and I, I do agree. I just thought it was, um, I just thought it was quite, quite interesting. Um, uh, that you know, he is interesting. Incidentally, that photo he's got on his Facebook page, he looks like Matthew McConaughey drinking tea. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's a wise professor. Look, yeah, I like that. Oh well, yeah, I just looked at that. Like, who is that, Matthew McConaughey? No, no, it's not. It's Mr. Steele. <laughs> um. I guess on that vein, though, um, and I, I, you know, I could guess what you're going to say here, but I'd rather, rather not. Uh, have your views on, I guess, I know you hate the words high intensity training, but I guess evidence based resistance training, if you want a better term, uh, have they evolved in any way uh, since we last spoke? Uh, and more specifically, have you made any significant change to the Big Five protocol or your exercise recommendations in general? Well, um, I haven't been a big five advocate for quite a while. Um, I normally only do three, <clears throat> and I'm at times it's even a big two. Um, you know, again, after 40 years engaged in this activity, my limit was long ago reached. So now I have no interest in losing what strength and functional ability I possess, but I, I don't want to preserve it by driving up needless amounts of wear and tear. So it's the least amount of exercise I can do that will accomplish my goal. And uh, it's interesting in some respects how Mike Menser was onto this in the late 90s. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, as far as my training goes, no, I just you work hard as you can. I try to dump as much glucose out of my muscles as I can for uh, health reasons uh, during my workout, which means I, I try to train intensely or in a high-energy output uh, fashion. And... Uh, I, I do it once a week. You know, that's that's about it. How do not, you, not very revolutionary. No, no, it's interesting though. How, how do you? Um, are you? I mean, you've always advocated to people, you know, unless they're a professional bodybuilder or something like that, that they schedule their their uh, workouts around their life. Um, so, will you will you always have like a set seven days between workouts, or will you sometimes have like four days or nine days, and it will just vary depending on your schedule. Yeah, exactly. I, the latter. Um, 
I will, uh, there are some times if I'm feeling particularly energetic or there's a lull at the gym and I want to experiment with something I may work out. And so, um, you know, I might have, have two workouts. Other times, 10 days could go by, um, but I don't obsess about it. Um, usually I train on Wednesday evenings because one of my trainers, a uh, fellow named Jeremy Heimers, uh, he and I are approximately the same strength level, so it makes our workouts even quicker because I don't have to change the weights. Uh, but he and I will work out together, and we're done generally in about six minutes. <laughs> um, what, what made you reduce your volume so much? Or, or Well, not so much, but I guess a, a fair bit. Uh, I can't put my finger on precisely what caused me to reduce it, other than uh, initially perhaps experimentation, uh, particularly once I had the Bod Pod machine and saw that my body did not, you know, super compensate um, at all until 10 days had passed. So I just didn't see any upside to training more frequently. Um, if I was sort of in a below baseline uh, point uh, and then threw another workout on, on top of that, I would just auger myself further into the ground. So uh, the idea would be that I wanted to spend more days above baseline enjoying what what additional you know energy and strength I may have stimulated with a previous workout, um, than spending more time below baseline, you know, and, and feeling you know weaker and not as energetic, etc. But uh, long gone are the days where you know I want to get into the gym, you know, frequently. Um, I it just it's no longer a priority for me, and I uh, I see it in some respects as oh like the uh, the the naivete of a you know sort of misapplied intellect during my youth <laughs> um how so you mentioned you've not been an advocate of a big five protocol for a long time uh, how long have you been doing i guess a a, a smaller or, you know sort of big three or big two routine for then i i'm pretty sure i was probably onto that when last we spoke and probably for some time before that um and again i, I mean I, I remember one year i tested myself in the bod pod doing various protocols and found that the gains uh, per se were pretty much the same right across the board. So if I went ultra intense with, let's say, uh, hyper reps or I went uh, one set to failure or I used uh, a heavy duty variation or uh, max contraction, you name it, um, the gains were about the same. So uh, there was, in some cases, I'd only be doing one set of one exercise. Um, so it either spoke to the fact that, you know, my age and everything else had gotten to the point where there simply was not uh, a lot more uh, mileage to be had out of, out of uh, the workouts in terms of advancing uh, my gains, uh, or it simply spoke to uh, the fact that my priorities had shifted, you know, one, one or both, probably. I think I think you tend to lose enthusiasm for an endeavor once you start to see your progress slow down and you're putting more energy into an enterprise that simply isn't giving you a huge return on your investment. And so you try to bring your energy output more in line with uh, what your results are so that you know you're not netting out at a loss. And uh, that was, I believe, how I eventually tapered down. And again, when you see like no no tangible evidence that doing more is going to you know, make a significant uh, difference, then you start to question why you do do more. <laughs> um, and I mean, on the, that sort of brings up the topic of intensity a little bit. And I think we both know that it's evident that those who take, let's say, steroids will produce gains in muscular mass with all manner of training methodologies. And consequently, it is the environment within the organism that will ultimately determine whether or not such a gain will be produced more so than the stimulus. For those who are not on steroids, the novelty of applying almost any type of resistance training to your muscles will be considered a high intensity activity from the body's perspective. And, and it's largely why your body makes the adaptation initially. We know, for example, that an activity like washing dishes will not result in a sufficiently potent stimulus to produce change in the body because washing dishes doesn't require much of an energy output from the muscles at all. All responses from the organism in this regard are predicated upon energy output and allocation. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you output a considerable, a considerable amount of energy as a result of a given activity, there are, if you will, dialogues and calculations that take place on a cellular and subconscious level 
or an autonomic level, the way in the balance, the energy being output versus the energy on hand, and whether or not it's worth the body investing in a little bit more energy to build a bigger gas tank, that is a bigger muscle, which can be viewed as a gas tank of sorts. Uh, body fat could be viewed as a reserve tank. As energy is what allowed our excuse me, our ancestors to chase down food and avoid becoming food for bigger predators, it has survival value rather than cosmetic value. If you are engaging in an activity that drains the present gas tank you have, then those gas tanks need to be refilled. And if you train frequently in such a fashion, then they will have to be refilled frequently. And this may not have been possible in an environment of limited energy availability, such as existed when our genome was first formed. Our hunter-gatherer ancestors were lucky to pull 800 calories a day out of their environment. Today, we have no such problem. But our genetic signaling patterns, and indeed our genetics, weren't formed in our present-day environment of food abundance. They were formed in our former environment of food scarcity. So the body makes the calculation as to whether the energy required to build you a bigger gas tank, bigger cells, in other words, that need a little more energy to sustain and more glucose to store as fuel in these gas tanks, offsets and in the long run requires less energy than simply draining and refilling the gas tanks at their present size. If it saves the body energy, it goes with the former. If your workouts only drain, say, 10% of your energy out of the working muscles, then the body calculates that it still has 90% that was left untapped and unutilized, and thus the size and capacity of that gas tank is fine as it is. If you do an activity that only leaves you with 10% of your initial capacity, then there is a good possibility that a change will be made for, for the ultimate survival priority of conservation of energy. Everything we do is inclined or regulated by our desire to conserve energy, which is one of the reasons we hate high energy output activity on both a biological and a psychological level. Our bodies don't believe that such activity is compatible with survival. So high energy output is a requirement, which you can call high intensity, if you want to even have your body consider investing in changing your muscle size. What the energy output threshold is, however, I'm not sure, but it will be enough to make you uncomfortable as the feeling of discomfort is your body telling you to stop whatever the hell it is you're doing as you are now outputting enough energy that it will have to seriously bring the matter to the board for consideration in order to find a way to stem its losses. So the, the intensity equation as it applies to protocols is, you know, it has to be a, a, of a demanding nature for your body to make the investment. Yeah, I mean, I know you 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 use the um, the uh, saying uh, brief, intense, and infrequent as the kind of principles. Um, but I guess, I mean, I hear the thing is maybe, maybe um, I sort of taken on faith that story and i don't mean i mean i don't mean to call it a story but you know you're what you just described and the way you described it um you obviously hear a lot in the well you hear a similar version of that in the kind of high intensity training sphere um and i guess i just never question it but you know why why can't someone train with high frequency and you know deplete that gas tank all the way down and then not have mm -hmm. that completely refilled in 24 hours. Like, I just, I've never seen or experienced uh, in training clients or myself or in, in the literature that it's, it's replenished quite so quickly. And it may be, but I, I would think that eventually, um, especially as you get older, again, the, again, the landscape changes. Uh, cells don't regenerate and repair as rapidly as they did when you were, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. So to assume that it's going to continue um, to regenerate and replenish at the rate that it did when you were much younger, when there's entropy present, um, I just I don't see that as realistic. Yeah, that's just I mean, I think it's good. I mean, let's let's explore this together. Let's look into it. I mean, if you are going to if you're going to output a lot of energy, enough energy for change to be uh, invested in by the body, um, we do know that the change requires a certain amount of time and requires a considerable energy investment over and above what you have expended in your workouts to prompt the body to make the change. So, if you are if the body is going to do this and it will build you a bigger gas tank, theoretically, depending on your type of training, it can take longer to drain it. 
which would certainly allow if you're, if you're um, training at let's say the same level of, of energy output, it might require you know repeated uh, attempts or multiple training sessions to bring it down to a meaningful level in order to um, stimulate an adaptive response from the body. But um, again, it comes down to what are your priorities? Mm. You know, what yeah. how much of an adaptation? And given the genetic cap that's involved, um, you know, why why would we be looking in that direction anyway? Yeah, yeah. I, I think optimally, if you want to evolve exercise, uh, you know, theoretically speaking, um, you want to be able to get more for less. That would be an evolution, not get less for more. You know, more energy to get less results. So at a certain point, there becomes, uh, you know, the diminishing returns, which is you're outputting more energy for less and less gain. And those gains are capped. You cannot drive up. I mean, let's look at it even from a practical standpoint. I mean, you've been training for many years. I've been training for many years. Why don't either of us have a 20 inch arm? You know, we oh, don't. Yeah. Because yeah. Genetics is capped. It. Now, I can adopt Arnold's training routine. Uh, and do whatever, 20 sets for my biceps, 20 sets for my triceps, and and train my arms twice a week. But I'm not going to build a 20-inch arm. So why is that? You know, it's, it's, and and <laughs> again, what is, what is the maximum I can build? And if so, do I really need to be in the gym seven days a week doing 20 sets for each body part? And the answer is no. Um, in fact, there was a study done. Uh, and I can send you the link uh, afterwards, where they looked at people who were doing, um, oh, what was it? Just, you know, sort of a like a, a seated row, a bench press, I think a pull down, maybe one other exercise. So, you know, just general exercises that people would do. And they wanted to see what effect uh, uh, would be produced if you if you added in direct arm work. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a longer workout. It's, uh, it's doing additional exercises specifically for the arms. And at the end of the study, they, they did their biopsies and did their testing and found there was no difference whatsoever, uh, in terms of hypertrophy. Um, you know, other studies have come out, which have shown that if you are naturally mesomorphic, uh, you're going to build uh, bigger muscles than someone who isn't. So genetics play a massive role in this. And, and simply pouring in more work um, stops producing results um, rather quickly. Um, so I'm not, you know, I don't know what you make of this, or, but that's, those, that's the data I'm looking at. And I can tell you from my own experience that, you know, if I, <laughs> if I, if I try to do a, uh, a three-day-a-week program, let's say like Steve Reeves used to do, where you're doing nine sets of body parts, uh, I might be able to get through it, uh, my first workout, maybe the second, but, uh, come Friday, I have no in inclination whatsoever to do that again. <laughs> and, so, and, and I remember that cause when I came back from interviewing Steve Reeves back in God, this was 88. So I was much younger then I was so pumped cause you know, I've got Steve Reeves secret routine, you know, I couldn't wait to put it into effect. And, uh, I think I got about three quarters of the way through the workout and it was just like, are you kidding me? Like <laughs> I could not square it, unfortunately with, uh, with I, uh, in the back of my mind, my, the, my intellect was saying, this is way too much exercise and there's so much overlap. My arms, for example, are already baked. So to then, you know, do nine sets of, uh, seated inclined curls was pointless at that point. Yeah. It's like a bazooka and the fly, right? <laughs> yeah well, you got it the first time <laughs> yeah um, well and i think most of us you know i hate to say it but i think most of us tapped out our potential for building big muscle many years ago for some of us decades ago but it's very hard to come to grips with that yeah. so so we keep looking for any bit of news or 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 anything that gives us you know a maybe as mr Steele indicated in his uh summary of the studies that may give us a benefit not that it will for sure categorically cause an effect but it may mm -hmm. and you know we're, that's enough for us to you know to hang our hopes on and away we go down that path so uh, i just you know I, I hate to pour 
cold water on people's enthusiasm. But I think the way exercise has been overhyped over the decades as being a panacea, like you can look like anybody you want to just simply by doing this or adding this supplement or doing this exercise. Uh, I think the fires needed to be dampened a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think I think most of my audience are aware of their limitations, um, but perhaps um, I do I do completely agree that this might this is a really in in some ways a pointless line of inquiry, um, and I just I just I'm glad you just described all that because I just I mean I told I I, I said in a in a blog post or uh, on the in, in the intro to the James Steele interview, you know, this is the last. I say that we've been talking about it for the last 20 minutes, but this is the last, um, you know, podcast we're going to do, which is such, such a laser focus on, you know, uh, inducing how to stimulate more muscle hypertrophy because I've done the topic to death. And I feel like if you go through right. my work uh, and, you know, the conversation we had before, all the previous conversations I've had with other people who are experts in this, it's clear that, um, you know, we already know how to get the most, the, the best results. And chances are, if you've been lifting weights for three or four years, fairly consistently, um, you've probably got all you can, you know, <laughs> or 90% yeah. anyway. Um, exactly. so and the I, only people who, who improve after that are people that change the uh, environment of the organism by adding anabolic drugs. Yes, that does. It will change your appearance for sure, but it's, uh, it's an exogenous, uh, mediated uh, elements. So as soon as you stop taking them, you lose the gain. So at the end of the day, uh, you're not really gaining much of anything. I, you know, it's funny when I was looking into the hypertrophy component, and I can't remember if we discussed this last time we spoke, but to me, it seems that we may have been looking at the wrong constituent of muscle. Yeah, with the water. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, exactly. Everyone's focusing on the tissue component. And again, that is what is mediated by genetics. Uh, you're not going to suddenly just sprout all of this tissue that, that needs to be uh, innervated and supplied with energy on a daily basis. But the glucose or the water component, which is 76% of the water, certainly accounts for volume. And that's why when you see guys that inject an irritant like synthol into their arms, they, they morph into these you know, elephantine proportions, um, and the circumference gets much bigger. The tissue hasn't gotten any bigger, you know, so all this stuff about, you know, creatine and amino acids and protein is irrelevant. It's strictly the body um, producing a, an edema in that area. Um, and certainly, and I saw another study, and I apologize for not having it at my fingertips, that the bulk of the gains that... Uh, new trainees experience is water retention in the area. Uh, so, you know, we, everyone crows about how, you know, the first year of working out or the first six months of working out is when you really see the big gains. And it's true, but most of it is water retention. So um, I believe it's dumping glycogen, glycogen coming in and, and water bonding to glycogen at three grams per gram. And, and there you have it. I mean, they're probably depending on the protocol, there's some damage and thus some tissue repair and, and growth, much like scar tissue. But, um, it's pretty minuscule. Yeah, it's um, that's interesting. I didn't know that actually. That that was the the sort of initial signs. Um, do you know, I often, and I'm sure you get this a lot. Um, but I, I've, and now and again, I get emails or messages from people that say that say, "Oh, I did this protocol for this amount of time, and then I changed to this protocol, and I got amazing results." But then changing back to the former, I, <laughs> you know, I didn't get good results. And and I'm I'm kind of just reading it and thinking, you know. Are they just got a bit, a little bit um, disillusioned, you know, um, and eluding themselves, and maybe because they're not really tracking things properly or tracking their variables very well, um, and actually, you know, it's not it's not the protocol actually that's causing them to to look different. Uh, it's just I don't know. It could be a number of things, but I just I just don't always find it's a very it doesn't really go anywhere this type of back and forth because it doesn't seem to really make sense to me. Do you know what I mean? Have you experienced this type of thing and, and how do you normally yeah, address I, it with people? I would I I kind of attribute that to what I've called the conservation of energy syndrome or, or uh, um which is I believe manifest in everything we do. I think our body's programmed to conserve energy because of their survival value. Um, and so, for example, um, 
you do a certain protocol, uh, whatever it is, and you're able to do uh, well, you're able to, to show on your workout graph that you've, you've made market improvement, but the, there's not really much else happening. You don't see, um, you know, much improvement in your physique. Uh, maybe the weights of uh, not going up at the rate they used to. But when you switch your protocols, this represents a novel uh, stimulus to the body. And it doesn't get that, oh, Lawrence is doing this workout and now he's he's doing a different workout. It just knows that if you were to graph your energy output, this new activity is requiring much more energy. So it takes it pretty seriously. And um, what happens is it throws way more than it needs to into the activity initially because it doesn't know that you're not in danger. It doesn't know what why you're putting more energy. It just knows that you are. So, so you, you are involving more fibers initially than you would. And then over repeated exposure to this, your body then figures out it, that it doesn't need to put quite so much into what it's been doing. And eventually, it comes down to just the motor units required at just the second that they're required in that movement to perform. And consequently, muscle fiber involvement and um, energy supplying those, those working muscles gets diminished. And you see this in everything we do. The first time you drove a standard automobile, you were probably exhausted. Because every muscle, more muscle than what was required to perform the activity, was engaged in it. Uh, so your muscles were tight. You're, you know, you're probably were sweating. You might even have been sore the next day. But you did it again and again and again and again. And a month later, just the fibers at just the time you need them come into play when you're shifting gears. And you might even, you know, have one arm out the window, keeping time with a song on the radio. You see this with runners who run on treadmills during the winter months. At least here in Canada, they do. And then spring comes around and they go to do their first road run and they are exhausted. They feel like they've never run before in their lives. Um, you know, their heart's going like a trip hammer. Sweat is cascading down their brows. Uh, their muscles are sore. They're, they're heaving. Their chests are heaving. and the Breathing is labored. But they do it again. They do it again. Do it again. And a month later, that same route run in the same time has almost no effect at all. And they, they mistakenly attribute that to an improvement in their cardiovascular system or their heart and their lungs and their cells and all of these things, when in fact, the first time out, their heart and lungs were servicing close to 100% of uh, muscle tissue that contribute to the event. But over time, it scaled back, and maybe it was only servicing the working of 35%. And so consequently, your pulse rates are not going to be uh, off the chart, or your muscles aren't going to be as sore, uh, because you're not involving as much of them. So I think periodically changing a program is not a bad thing. It might it might um, recruit more fibers into service than heretofore had been brought into play with a protocol that the body had uh, grown accustomed to. There was an interesting study on this, well, what turned out to be this phenomenon, and uh, again, I'll send you the link, but it involved women and walking, <clears throat> how many calories they burn. And so they had these women walk a certain distance, and they measured through urinalysis and various other testing um, how many calories they'd burned in the course of this activity. Then they put an exoskeleton on them, which changed their gait. And they found that uh, the first time they walked in that exoskeleton, they burned way more calories because the body was having to adjust and it was difficult. And um, But immediately after that, the very next time the body had made the adaptation, they were right back to burning the, the lesser amount of calories again. So it does show that, that fibers will come in, you know, if, they, if your body perceives that you could be under threat, you know, a new, a new activity that is now taking lots of energy out of the body, that can be viewed as threatful, particularly if you're an organism that lives in an environment of uh, energy scarcity, like our ancestors did. And again, that's where our genome comes from. So uh, it, it does everything it can to put some nitrous on your engine and get you out of trouble. But over time, it also recognizes that, hey, we didn't need this much for that. And we don't appear to be under any threat because we're doing this repeatedly without any, you know, any damage. So let's scale back a bit and we'll just give you what you need to accomplish it. But we're not going to give you 100 percent, if that makes sense. It does. It does. So on average, like how how often should one change their workout routine? Because obviously you want some time to adapt to the the workout you've just started or the routine um, so that you can see progress and measure that. So how often should it's, one change? It's hard to say, you know, I, I, um, 
I remember reading again another study where they were looking at um, tissue building, how long it took tissue building. And they initially the first um, few bouts of, of exercise, I can't remember how many off the top of my head, was mainly uh, uh, glucose differential and energy for that. But if you did it repeatedly, eventually it would yield to a, a, a mass increase. A, a minor one, but a mass increase nonetheless. So um, <clears throat> I, I think it's going to vary with people. I mean, it has to vary with people because, you, you know, some people are are better uh, capable of putting in 100% effort into a given activity th than others. Um, um, what do they call that? Neuromuscular efficiency. <clears throat> That's a big factor in it. Um, so I think – I don't, I don't think there's a rule of thumb and, and, um, I think probably the safer way to go is just when you, when you're bored to death doing what you're doing, change it. You're not going to, it's not going to hurt you, you know, um, and repeating the same thing for a limited gain, which is what most people are going to be looking at, um, can get boring pretty quick. So after a certain amount of years in the, in this game, change it up as often as you feel you need to, uh, it, it won't make a difference. I think we get too hung up on this. Oh, I mean, when, when is the exact time I should change it or, or how long should I be on this program before for what, you know, what, what is the gain? What is the gain you have actually experienced in the last year doing what you're doing? Because it's probably not going to move the needle too much either way. So now you're dealing, the shift goes from a physiological phenomenon more to a psychological motivational phenomenon, whatever keeps you motivated um, to keep doing it, then by all means do it. If, um, as James Steele uh, implied, uh, a more frequent, you read his study and you think, uh, oh, well, maybe training more frequently, I'll do it. See what, see what, see how you net out. Um, you know, we're, <laughs> it, this isn't, uh, to be honest and to keep it in perspective, this isn't that important. But if you're obsessed about it and you think it's that important, well, then go down the trail with it a bit. See what, you know, training whatever, two or three or four or five, six days a week yield you. And at what point does it stop? You know, and then once it stops, then, you know, then the question, I mean, not the question, but the evidence is quite clear that it had zero to very little effect. So was it worth it? I don't know. That's up to the individual. <laughs> Um, I wanted to. I think you know. I think we've 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 covered exercise fairly well. I mean, we can we can sort of dip back into it um, when we may do that. But I just wanted to ask you about your current diet. Um, how how do you currently currently eat? You know, <laughs> how many how many meals per day? What, what sort of was your diet look like? I, I'm embarrassed to tell you. I really have nothing to say on that. I I, I eat when I'm hungry. Uh, I probably. Uh, I, and again, for the same reason, I realize that such exactitude to to uh, proportions and uh, uh, partitioning and all of that really had zero to little difference uh, on anything that I did. I think it's important to eat healthy, to eat a balanced diet, because our cells require different vitamins and minerals, uh, which can only be had out of a balanced diet. But uh, having said that, I mean, I, I, know, I understand that intellectually, but do I apply it on a daily basis? Hell no. You know, I was, I had six beers last night. You know, so, oh, before our podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to screw up the courage somehow, Lawrence. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to eat normally. And it's funny, you know, I, <clears throat> I guess part of the reason for this uh, lackadaisical attitude on my part was the death of Steve Reeves, actually, because here was a man who only ate food that was grown out of his garden on his ranch. Uh, I mean, this was as natural, organic uh, an eater as you could find. And uh, a guy who grew up in the physical culture era, right in the heart of it, you know, so he was not, uh, I mean, he would occasionally have, you know, sweets and cakes and uh, even the odd beer, I can attest. Um, but generally, he was very, very uh, calculated about what he put into his body. And, I mean, he died in his 70s. So it didn't yield him a huge health benefit. He died at 74, um, didn't he? What, what, how did he die? He, I don't remember. Uh, he died of a blood clot uh, oh, following right. a surgical procedure, um, which is, you know, had nothing to do with his diet. Um, but it just shows that there is – 
there's random chance operating in a lot of this that we can't account for. Um, so, you know, I see people that are um, paleo. I see people that are China study, and they're very um, oh militant about their about their dietary uh, viewpoints. And uh, we even have a physician in town who is very pro China study, and he does cooking classes and everything else. And I mean, if that's if that, you know, at the end of the day causes you to eat in a, a, a healthier manner, well, that's great. You know, and maybe that's what you need. But I always, the best dietary advice I ever had was from Mike Menser. And, and he told me, eat a little bit of everything and not too much of anything. You know, I mean, we, we survived as a species because our bodies were able to take pretty much anything we could find and turn it into pretty much anything we needed. And so when I hear people say no carbs after 6 p.m., I think back of uh, a hunter-gatherer ancestor stumbling into an apple orchard at seven o'clock at night. Is he not going to eat apples? Yeah. Is that you know why? Because that will help him survive. Um, saying no, I can't have any carbs after seven is ridiculous. If we if that was necessary for our health and our longevity, we wouldn't have survived as a species. So again, nutrition has been made very complicated, largely because people are selling things, and the same way that exercise is. I mean, up until what, the 1800s, there really wasn't any type of exercise per se. There was, there was physical activity, and the people that did demanding physical activity tended to, uh, I don't even know if they lived longer, to be honest, but they, they you know, perhaps appeared to be more fit than their uh, neighbors did. But you know, the general lifespan hasn't changed all that much, and it doesn't change much amongst those who uh, are super active versus those who are not super active. Uh, and I'm, I don't use a false dichotomy there of the guy who's on the couch versus the guy who's a marathoner. It's nobody is that inactive and very few of us are that active. But, uh, you know, if, you know, there's lots to say about it. I mean, the, 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 the whole concept of, uh, being physically active makes you live longer and be healthier and have uh, greater cardiovascular health came from, a study that was done in England in, uh, in a publication called Lancet that involved uh, conductors and bus drivers. And they found that the conductors who were running up and down between uh, levels on double-decker buses uh, tended to have less heart disease than the drivers who were uh, more sedentary and just sat behind the wheel of the bus. Ergo, they believed that the activity had a direct marker on it. But unfortunately, what you were seeing was sort of reverse selection. Those that were healthier were able to do jobs that involved more activity, such as running up and down the levels on a double-decker bus, where those who were less healthy to begin with uh, chose sedentary jobs that didn't require activities that they weren't really able to do uh, as a result of their lack of health. But nevertheless, when that study came out, everybody assumed that activity improved cardiovascular markers or parameters and thus uh, made made one healthier and, and could live a longer life. But it was... Not really an accurate study, but that's that's the one that kind of launched the whole be more active movement. Okay. I want to think it was in the fifties, but I can't I can't be sure. I think it was fifty two. Yeah. That's really interesting. And that's that's the same thing as selection bias, isn't it? In play. It is that's yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That, that, I think that catches a lot of people out. It certainly catches me out a fair bit. Um Okay, while I've got you, John, I do really want to talk to you about some philosophy stuff, if that's okay. Um sure. So I watched your one of your I say one of your uh, documentaries um, about Bruce Lee recently and really really enjoyed it. Um, I can't remember what it was called now, which is awful, but um, hopefully you'll you'll remember. Um, now, if I'm really curious, obviously Bruce Lee, you know, unfortunately died very young, um, and you know, I was fascinated by how he you know got really into martial arts had. Um, created his own martial art and then obviously founded a few schools based on that but then totally changed his mind (laughs) and basically said you know what there is no way there's only um there's no one way there's only way and and that's that's different for every person um so there is no like one style that is more effective than another and i just wondered you know if what do you think if he was still alive today um okay like Obviously, he'd be very old, but let's assume he was in his mid-30s. <laughs> right. Like, 
would he have continued refining martial arts for optimal effectiveness in real life? And do you, how would you think he would, this is a crazy question, but how do you think he would have matched up against say today's kind of MMA, you know, UFC fires and that type of thing? Whew. Um, well, it's hard to say. Would he have continued to refine? Yeah. I think that's the way he was wired mentally. He was always looking to, um, to refine what he had and, and to, and to chip away the unessentials, as he would say. So to make something more simple, direct, and efficient, uh, those are the <laughs> the martial art buzzwords that uh, similar to uh, uh, intense, brief, and infrequent in the high intensity world. Um, so he would be looking to make his techniques more simple, direct, and efficient. Uh, how would he fare against UFC fighters? Well, any it's funny. I mean, any fighter um, is they have a certain genetic gift for what they do. And that's why they're, they are fighters. Um, he was light years ahead of anybody in his era. That's for sure. Um, and I think he would, I mean, if you could transplant him to present day, had he been so inclined to compete in a UFC type event, I think he would have done very well, probably would have been a champion, but he would have been more inclined to meet the guy on the street because he didn't believe in rules, didn't believe in, you know, having a corner man or someone to break up a fight. He, um, and he, at least his, his belief was try and get the fight over as quickly as possible. Um, so it wouldn't be, you know, multiple rounds. It would be however long it was going to be, but, and you trained because you didn't know how long it was going to be. And that's why he was such a, a zealous trainer. Um, and he had it, he, he had a very interesting perspective, which I think has been proven true. And that is no one can predict how they are going to be attacked. So how can you, how can you rehearse a response to an attack that uh, hasn't occurred yet? And that you don't know how it will play out. Your body just has to be able to adapt like sound to echo, um, to whatever you're confronted with. And that's how he was trying to, uh, that was the direction he was heading, certainly. Uh, I mean, he was training his neural system. He was training his brain. He was listening. Um, he had, I don't know the exact device, but he had a thing where he could, uh, it was like a stereo headset where he could hear dripping water in one uh, speaker and some other noise in the other one. And he was trying to use his mind to isolate just the one from the other. And he would constantly be looking at people, even if he was out eating at a restaurant. And if a fellow made a certain gesture more than once, he would try to time it. And much like someone might throw a punch, you know, what's his rhythm for that? I mean, mentally, he was very, very uh, active. And of course, physically, he was a phenom. Um, so, uh, you know, he would have continued, I believe, to be on in the vanguard of advancing uh, martial theory and martial art generally. How did you, how did this all begin with you? How did you ha happen to get, you know, the permission to um, get access to a lot of his writing and journals and work and then obviously go on to write so many books and produce films on his behalf? <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it's funny um, that the best way to explain it would be um, something. Uh, well, I'll, I'll explain it to you here. Joseph Campbell, uh, once his, his mantra was always follow your bliss or follow your passion. And that if you follow your passion, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. And when you can see that you begin to meet people who are in your field of passion and they open doors to you. Um, and it's important to note that as Campbell saw it, it wasn't merely a matter of doing whatever you like and certainly not doing simply what you're told. It was a matter of identifying that pursuit of which you're truly passionate and attempting to give yourself absolutely to it. And there is, he referenced a mythological uh, reference uh, called Indra's net, which I've always found intriguing. And according to Hindu philosophy, there is a net that is cast across the breadth and length of the entire universe. And in each juncture of this net, there is a jewel. And if you look deeply into any one jewel, you will see reflected in it every other jewel in the universe. And this is a metaphor. And it means that if you go into anything passionately and deeply, you will eventually come to see talents expressed from within you that you didn't know you had. 
And I'll give you a brief example from my own experience. When I was a kid, I was a huge Bruce Lee fan. I, I delved into this man's life like no other person I ever admired. I read everything I could on him. I studied his films, read his writings, and so on. And I had this passion that could not be satisfied. Through my research into the man, I became interested in martial arts and studied them. And, and then I decided I needed to build up my body like he had. And this led to an interest in bodybuilding. This led to my crossing paths with Mike Menser. This led to writing about uh, training. Uh, my writing about training led to a job offer in California, writing for Joe Weider's magazine. And this eventually led to my writing an article on Bruce Lee for these magazines. And this led to my writing a book on Bruce Lee, which led to my writing 12 more. One of those books was for Warner Brothers, who then asked me to produce and direct a film on Lee. And this led me to get into uh, films. The film that I was working on needed music, and this led me to write the music for the film. So out of one passion, Bruce Lee, other jewels revealed themselves. Martial arts, bodybuilding, writing, producing, directing, composing, all talents, if you will, that back in 1973, I didn't know I had in me. Through that one jewel, if you will, all of these other jewels were revealed. So I think if you are passionate about anything, and really give yourself 100% into it. You start to develop talents in, an, in a desire to express to others or communicate to others this passion that you have for this, uh, whatever it is, um, that you didn't know you had, but they will come, they will come to the fore um, as a matter of course um, as you attempt to explain it. So, you know, I, th I think just being a fan, I wouldn't have predicted that I would have done a film or, or a book or anything about Bruce Lee, but uh, it was weird. Bruce Lee once said that uh, that uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And if you're passionate about something, you're certainly prepared. And when the opportunity presents itself, you can you can act upon it. Oh, that's amazing. Um, how do you – so when you, when you do follow your bliss and my friend who um, – will probably be listening to this interview. It will love the fact that you just said that because he always says that uh, and quotes Joseph Campbell. Um, how do you distinguish between like pursuing your passion and then not deviating off that? Like you say, you start start looking at these other tangents that are related and realize you had a passion and, and, and uh, strengths in these areas too. Um, but how do you distinguish between whether you're deviating or staying congruent and doubling down? Because I would, I have that problem sometimes. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, it's hard. I don't. Uh, it's a hard question to answer because, you know, if you really like something, that's that's really foremost in your mind. That's all you want to talk about. And the various mediums that I talked about are just means of expressing um, that interest. Like, for example, if uh, if I had been writing for Joe Weider. And Warner Brothers came to me then and said, we want you to do a film on Gary Cooper. It wouldn't have been a very good film uh, because I'd have no passion for the subject. But if, if it's something that you're passionate about, well, look at you and your podcast. I mean, would you have known you could have done this 10 years ago or 15 years ago? No. But, you're, but you're passionate about exercise. And that led to wanting to discuss it with people that uh, were equally as passionate. And lo and behold, you've cultivated talents that you probably didn't know that you had. But it's one of these things that if you're not passionate about it, then don't don't fake passion. Uh, move on to what it, you're really passionate about. And it may be that it's not something you can earn a living from. Not everything is. But even if you retain that passion and keep that fire burning on the side, you might be surprised that eventually it does lead to something that uh, will allow you to devote all of your time to that and to support yourself. And that just, it, you know, it sort of grows by what it feeds upon at that point. Oh, that's really, that's, that's just very helpful to me right now. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, okay, so Bruce Lee had a, he had a, um, he seriously injured himself weightlifting. Um, and when he, whilst he was recovering from his back injury, I understand he was bedridden for around six months where he devoured a lot of philosophy and motivational writing and all sorts. Um, and he read, he read Alan Watts, um, as one, it was one of the, the authors he, you know, books he, he, he consumed. Um, do you, ha do you know, based on what you, you know, what you know of Bruce Lee, it sounds like you pretty much know everything. <laughs> do you know how Alan Watts influenced him and to what degree? <clears throat> 
Well, uh, Alan Watts influenced him long before he injured his back. Um, and he certainly had a big influence. Um, Bruce used to record uh, a television program on reel-to-reel tape that Watts hosted that uh, was broadcast out of San Francisco. So this would have placed it sometime, I think, after Bruce went to Oakland, um, which would have been 64, 65. And uh, Bruce would listen to the recordings. Uh, he also had several of Watts' books. And it's interesting that a Westerner, Alan Watts, would be the philosophical teacher of a man from the East on the ways and nuances of Eastern thought, but so it was. Watts and through him other popularizers of Zen, which were it was starting to um, have a uh, gain gain ground and audience in the sixties, uh, found their way into Bruce's library and his consciousness. Um, I got to know Alan Watts's son, Mark Watts, quite well, and as he pointed out to me, many of Lee's ideas were once expressed by Alan Watts, Krishnamurti, Suzuki, Joseph Campbell, many others, and long before uh, these people. Sp- uh, said them by um, sages such as Lao Tzu, Xuan Tzu, Buddha, uh, Shankara. Uh, and while these ideas aren't new, their expression embodies uh, what Watts called a living art that points to a way of liberation uh, that his father once described as the religion of no religion. Uh, this led in time uh, to cause Lee to abandon the notion of, in terms of, of martial arts, in terms of styles, methods, and labels altogether. And we do kind of see now Eastern and Western cultures have passed while heading in opposite directions, uh, thus setting the stage for the development of an East-West culture based on the best of each. You know, the adventurous spirit and curiosity of the West and the highly developed philosophical and aesthetic sensibilities of the East. The mutual receptivity of these elements has already contributed greatly to the birth of well-integrated ways of knowing, much like yin-yang. Uh, so... Um, Watts was a, was a very big influence on Bruce and, and he was also a conduit into other, uh, authors and sages who were of like mind. And I think that, that was very, uh, stimulating to Bruce Lee. Do you have any, um, I guess mentors growing up? Um, like not, I guess those that you read in books, but also that you had, uh, that you met in person that had a big impression on you in a positive way. Uh, I've, I've met, I've met some interesting people. Uh, I met, uh, Alfred Julius Ayer, who was the founder of logical positivism. Uh, I was a huge Bertrand Russell fan. Would have loved to have met, uh, Mr. Russell, Lord Russell. Sorry. Um, and there's, I mean, just different ones. Most, I mean, most of the people that have had uh, a kernel of influence have passed on now. So I'm Leonard Peikoff, who is an objectivist uh, philosopher. I always found uh, stimulating and enjoyed conversing with him quite a bit. But, um, you know, in terms of a general, uh, you know, a philosopher that who's who I've embraced, uh, I can't say that I have. Um, mainly because I remember when I was doing the editing of the Bruce Lee books that it, I, I became aware of the temptation to simply accept what he said, um, and adopt it as, as a philosophy without question. And I think there's a danger in having idols and heroes in that I once said that if you stand too close to the river of another man's thoughts, you can be swept off the bank and away from yourself. And that's true. Um, You know, there's a you inside of you, of course, and your experience is going to be different than mine. And that's going to shape your your own philosophy, your own sense of reality, if you will. And listening to the words of some beer-drinking Canuck over here in Canada – is not necessarily uh, a desirable thing to do. I think you've got to pursue the truth um, for yourself. And as far as, you know, we kind of look for the intelligent design, even philosophers are guilty of that, you know, what is the best way, you know, to live your life? And, you know, certainly brighter minds than mine have grappled with this over the years. And I have no surefire prescription, but I am aware of many pitfalls as I've often suffered them. And I think being a seeker, for truth is 
and, and for a better way is a great thing, but it's not without its potential problems. Voltaire said, cherish those who seek the truth, but beware of those that find it. And I agree with the Frenchman on that, because those who believe they found it are quick to turn it into a cause, and a cause requires voluminous support to sustain itself. And in the pursuit of voluminous support, the truth can often be superseded by the supposed truth of the cause itself, and the two become synonymous. Pursue the truth by all means, but keep it to yourself, uh, <laughs> for that is should be the only person you've sought it for. You know, nothing is often a good thing to do and always a clever thing to say in such matters, uh, with acknowledgement to Mr. Will Durant. Um, as far as influences goes, uh, Mike Menser was my conduit in many ways. He introduced me to philosophy, and I quite liked that. And, and um, Mike made a statement many years ago, um, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, so if you, I actually typed it out here just cause yeah, yeah, it's, no it's pretty profound. And this was, this would have been around 1980 that Mike said this and he was asked if he had a coping mechanism, uh, for dealing with grief, sadness, etc. And he said, I do have a coping mechanism, one that always works and really seems eminently reasonable. And that is that whenever I experience something like grief, sadness, unhappiness, what I say to myself is what I am experiencing is my own humanity. This is what makes me a human being. And grief is an integral part of the human condition. And anyone who hasn't experienced grief, intense grief, as that experience, say, at the loss of a loved one, has really missed out on a very essential aspect of the human experience. And as he said, I don't try to evade these feelings or escape from them. But then he always felt he'd been basically a psychologically sound individual and that he had within him, innately or naturally, this kind of a coping mechanism. And none of those experiences, intense sadness, grief, disappointment, or so forth, had ever gotten out of hand, at least at the time that he said this, uh, where he sought uh, or felt the need to resort to a natural escape. And it seems that there are many individuals like this who seem to be born with this built-in gyroscope, if you will, that never allows their psyche to go too far in any one direction. It always keeps them on a basically healthy path. And um, he had told me, he said that, uh, and I'm quoting now, I remember many, many years ago reading in an interview with Allen Ginsberg, a Latin expression, which was translated to the English, nothing human is foreign to me. And that was, I believe, attributed to the Roman playwright Terence in the play The Self-Tormentor, which would have been 170 to 160 BC. And Mike told me he was struck by the profundity of that statement, and it sort of became his credo. And it said, he told me it was one of the reasons he gravitated to psychiatry initially and psychology. He felt that nothing that any human being experienced was something divorced from myself. Uh, he said, I've always felt that I've had a certain capacity to empathize with what was going on inside people. I could get behind their experiences and experience what they were feeling. And that is sort of in accord with what I was just talking about earlier regarding the human experience and feelings such as disappointment, grief, sadness, unhappiness. To not feel those things is really an abdication of our humanity. And it is something we should allow, allow ourselves to feel and not be overwhelmed by. It's one of the essential aspects of being alive as a human being. And you know, we often look for happiness you know how do i the pursuit of happiness you know how do we maintain happy but that is that's such an unnatural state and such an, uh, a non-human state can you imagine being perpetually gleeful 24 7 um it would be <laughs> it would be meaningless um and that's why i've always kind of been impressed by and maybe i got this through reading bruce lee but um the philosophy underlying yin and yang and, you know, life does contain apparent opposites, conflicts, but in the bigger picture, they may be necessary in order for us to make any sense of it at all. I mean, in the yin yang philosophy, without darkness, light has no meaning. Without sadness, what does happiness mean? Without female, what would it mean to be male? And so on. But always, and unlike the Buddhists, I believe you should retain a sense of yourself um, for reasons that I've indicated. Um, it's too easy to find a philosopher or a theologian who inspires you and you you know, rapidly devour whatever he says or writes and then simply project it out as if you were but a conduit, you know, from his nucleus. But you get lost in all of this and becoming simply a mouthpiece for someone else's, else's thoughts, which may or may not even be true and thus, you know, not worth transmitting. So I, you know, for what it's worth, I would find out about you and the life that you possess 
and you will cre- and you will create your own philosophy, which will be far more interesting and true than that of anyone who is not you. Um, Alan Watts, you mentioned Alan Watts. He had a great uh, anecdote about. Um, I call it the maybe story, but it's actually based on a Chinese farmer, which in turn was based on a Chinese Taoist tale, which reveals that things aren't always what they seem, and even bitter misfortune may not be as bad as we might have perceived at the time. If you don't mind, I'll read it to you. It's only about a paragraph. But I will send you the link because nobody can read anything like Alan Watts. He sounds like Jeremy Irons. So uh, <laughs> He does. <laughs> he said, once upon a time, there was a Chinese farmer whose horse ran away. That evening, all of his neighbors came around to commiserate. They said, we are so sorry to hear your horses run away. This is most unfortunate. The farmer said, maybe. The next day, the horse came back, bringing seven wild horses with it. And in the evening, everybody came back and said, oh, isn't that lucky? What a great turn of events. You now have eight horses. The farmer again said, maybe. The following day, a son tried to break one of the horses, and while riding it, he was thrown and broke his leg. The neighbors then said, oh, dear, that's too bad. And the farmer responded, maybe. The next day, the conscription officers came around to conscript people into the army, and they rejected his son because he had a broken leg. Again, all the neighbors came around and said, isn't that great? And again, he said, maybe. The farmer steadfastly refrained from thinking of things in terms of gain or loss, advantage or disadvantage, because one never knows. In fact, we never really know whether an event is fortune or misfortune. We only know our ever-changing reactions to ever-changing events. And that's that's kind of a cool story. Uh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> because you don't often know, and we can and we can rightly feel the you know sadness and being overwhelmed in that. But that doesn't mean that it's disastrous. You know, things can uh, often lead to better things, and. Uh, as Bruce Lee used to say, it's only after the, you know, after the rainstorm that uh, the rainbow appears, you know, so. Yeah, it's funny. I had a, uh, <laughs> this experience yesterday. I just left a basketball pickup session uh, and I'm like, you know, halfway home from the session and I realized I picked up the wrong basketball and I've got a nice molten leather basketball which is not cheap and i suddenly just got really upset about it i was like oh and it, the, the weather was awful so i didn't want to have to go back and retrieve the ball and then i'm trying to get my phone out because i'm trying to write on the facebook group can someone save that and i can pick it up next week and i'm getting you know i can as i'm walking home i can feel myself getting quite angry about it but at the same time i'm trying to say to myself this is so trivial this doesn't matter <laughs> so like, stop letting it like be important and get to you because it's just going to make it worse and worse and you're going to get home you're going to take it out on your girlfriend and then that's going to just get worse and it's just it's not required it's not necessary and um it's it's i know this was <laughs> this is far more trivial than i suppose the uh, story you told but um it just made me think of that was all yeah no absolutely and that i mean it is those real life uh situations that make these uh you know abstractions such as watts offered in his story uh relevant because you can see the connection this is this... the big Sorry. thing there is and i think it's important that you draw it into your own life experience otherwise it's meaningless it's an abstraction this this may be really hard to answer um and it's probably one of those questions that you may have to or you don't obviously have um you know an hour or two hours left but um it may take that long to respond um and and i'll just be curious what have you learned from all the 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 philosophy that you've that you've read um and how have you how have you then applied that and how does it kind of manifest itself in your in the way you live your life and your daily routine is there anything specific that you think that you found to be very helpful that i guess you could that the listeners would find useful or i would find useful from that Geez, I don't know. Um, you know, I've, <laughs> I've read a, a lot of philosophy over the years, and there have been certain philosophers who have gripped me, um, and and I was completely won over by their philosophy. And I mentioned Bertrand Russell; he was a huge influence when I was younger. Uh, in fact, the university I went to, they had his archive, so I I used to skip classes to go up to the Bertrand Russell archive and read over his material, and I felt I got more out of that than uh, the formal classes edu- in philosophy that they were teaching. Um, but again, the, the big lesson there is how does it apply to you? 
Um, you know, Bertrand Russell was interesting, and, and sometimes it's almost like um, oh, different adages you'll you'll hear, like <laughs> certain Aesop's fables that you say, ah, yes, I can see the the relationship to life. A lot of it, unfortunately, a lot of philosophy is very abstract, very theoretical. A lot of it is is professors impressing one another. Um, it's like an exclusive club, but to bring it down into the streets and into real world is a skill that very few philosophers throughout history have possessed. Um, and at the end of the day, I recognize that it doesn't really matter what another thinker thought. Um, what matters ultimately in your life is what do you think? And we're, we're far too uh, willing to let someone else do the thinking for us. And I believe that now it probably ties into that conservation of energy syndrome that I talked about. Um, just like in, in, in workouts. I mean, if we can find a path of least resistance or less energy expenditure to accomplish the same thing, that's what we're interested in. When it comes to life and the mental energy that we burn through our glial cells in the brain, um, we would rather conserve energy and not burn so much energy if uh, someone else can you know, tell us what to do and how to live. And we, we are quite willing, more, more of us than not are willing to do that. You will fall in behind uh, a religious leader or a spiritual leader, or, or now if you don't like uh, the metaphysics of that, you'll go with a philosopher. Um, and there are philosophers that um, can speak to you at a certain point in your life and their message resonates. And that's great, but don't lose sight of the fact that you are more important than that philosopher because you're the only one that can live your life. And I, I tend now to look upon philosophy as like different types of clothing. Um, you know, there's a certain type of philosophy. I always find the Eastern philosophy, particularly the Taoist perspective, is kind of like a comfortable sweatshirt. And it tends to come to me at times when things aren't going too well. Maybe financially I'm in a bad place or um, my stress levels are high. Then the philosophy of the Tao sort of just says, you know, why are you getting so stressed about all of this artifice, you know, this nine to five rat trap nonsense? Uh, certainly there has to be more to it than that. And, uh, you know, let it go and, and seek the patterns of least resistance and because that's nature's way. That becomes very appealing. There's other times when uh, I'm, I have a little more leisure time that I don't have to uh, focus on day-to-day -day survival. And, and then I like a little bit more rigor and logical structure. I like that. And so I'll be, the pendulum will start to swing maybe towards some of the objectivist or uh, logical ones that are more left brain oriented philosophies. And, and suddenly I find those fascinating and, and I can see applications in my own life, but it really depends in my case, depends on where I'm at existentially, and I think it would be the same with uh, uh, you or anyone else. Do you so? Um, do you still read a lot of philosophy then in those areas? No, no, I don't. I, I've yet to see any that really compel me. I mean, you know, Will Durant said that uh, basically uh, all philosophy is footnotes to Plato. I think actually Alfred North White had said that, but uh, Durant uh, backed him up on it. A lot of the philosophical issues have already been covered by much brighter minds, uh, you know, in some cases thousands of years ago. Um, and, but it's there if you want to spend time with Plato or, by extension, Socrates or Aristotle or, um, you know, so any this, of the other. Is this like the Stoicism, philosophy, Stoic philosophy? Is that, does that capture and encapsulate those guys or is it more than that? Uh, no, the Stoics weren't uh, Platonists or, or uh, Socratics. Um, it's, it's an interesting philosophy, Stoicism, but it's, again, it's one of those things I always find with philosophy, you, you can travel with a philosopher, but only so far. I've yet to find one that you can make the full trip with. At some point, they're going to veer off the path and you're going to say, nah, it's not for me. And that's okay. That's the way it must be because ultimately you have to create your own path, you know, and, and, uh, if they, if they help you get out over a certain, uh, portion of difficult terrain and they've done their job but ultimately you have to make the trip intellectually and physically
I, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. It's really interesting. I when I was watching your documentary of uh, Bruce Lee and that interview where he's just so calm and confident and poised, in the way he speaks and communicates, and he talks about you know be like water and become the teapot. And I just I got so I was so I felt so happy like watching it and learning it's that whole learning experience is um is joyful in its own right um and that was something i haven't i don't think experienced in a while i've not had kind of profound learning curves lately i don't even you call that a learning curve but just learning something new that was just like oh right that's a really cool way of looking at things you know um and there's there's, there's kind of joy inherent in that which is really interesting um do you so okay, you don't read a great deal now. Is that in general, or, or do you still read? <laughs> do you read other stuff regularly, or how do you? I've got to be honest. I haven't. You know, I have not read a book now in probably three years. No, it's not true. No, I did read one six months ago, um, but huh. I don't go looking for um, philosophy books as I once did. I mean, if, if something new came out, a new disc. You know, a newly discovered transcript or audio recording of Alan Watts, I'd give it a listen just because I enjoy um, I enjoy his company, if you will. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, not not really. I, I think you know um, this. It's it's one of those things that uh, leisure time is what begets speculation, and and I haven't had a lot of that, so I, I really haven't um, been able to have the time to to or even the inclination to make time uh, to sit there and wade through a book and, and weigh it up as to what it means or, or that. I, there was a period of time where I, I was a voracious reader. I was a bibliophile, you know, and uh, but uh, not so much anymore. How do you spend your time now, if you don't mind me asking? Great, I mean, you mentioned uh, you got a, a lot of work on. Well, there was a – actually, sorry, the, I meant sorry. to conclude by saying that uh, Mark Watts had shared with me a statement from his dad, which – I think is apropos. And he said, when you get the message, hang up the phone. And I think that's the same thing. Uh, as far as coming to a certain perspective in philosophy, then you realize you don't need, you don't need to, you know, to be on the phone anymore. I got the message and the message is, uh, you know, seek your own path. So I'm sorry, what was your question? Sorry. And yeah, no, I was just curious, like, how do you, these days, like how do you, you mentioned you got a lot of work on um, before we started, you know, recording, and I'm just curious, how, how do you spend your time? And when you do get leisure time, which I appreciate may be uh, few and far at the moment, but how do you spend that? Um, well, uh, I mean, really, I've been far more interested in seeing uh, the life express itself through my kids. Uh, that, over the past 10 years, has, has become far more rewarding to me than any of my personal pursuits. Uh, watching my sons, for example, play hockey, or my oldest son uh, has be, you know, become a writer in the video gaming world and is out uh, following his bliss, if you will. All, all that sort of stuff. My daughters and uh, doing event planning and just traveling all over the place and loving it. I mean, that every time they come home, they bring a new energy into the house, which I love. And uh, uh, so I'm kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm living vicariously through them right now, but it's uh, <laughs> it's an enjoyable, enjoyable uh experience so uh, i may get back into more things i mean my time basically is, is going to the uh gym and training people and talking with them and then i just finished two books so that's occupied an awful lot of my time over the past year and uh editing a couple of films for uh, a good friend of mine by the name of david peterson and and then if i feel so inspired, I'll, I'll do uh, a film uh, on my own. But as is often the case, the subject matter I'm interested in is usually, uh, is usually pretty esoteric and <laughs> doesn't have a big general audience. So uh, oftentimes I'll do films just for my own benefit at this point. <laughs> no, I see. I often see uh, the pictures of your family on Facebook and you have a beautiful family and um, it's, it's, it's really cool. You just seem like, I'm sure like, you, you know, like every family you, you argue and there's no, no perfect family, but you look like the perfect family <laughs> when I see it. Um, I say that. Yeah. Uh, so 
I had a question from a listener was, uh, you know, are you, are you considering coming out with a new edition of body by science or, or any, I guess, future books with Doug or, or along that vein, do you think? Or I would love to do another book with Doug, but we haven't, uh, we haven't discussed that at all. I actually, I just finished another book on exercise on my own. Um, oh. and I, it's one of those things too, that, um, I think as we talked about with philosophy and finding your own path, um, I, I don't think you can be two people sharing a brain on a, on a book. You know, you're, you're going to have your viewpoints, uh, and the other person rightly is going to have theirs and they're going to be based on your personal experiences again. And, uh, that's what you write from with Doug and I had a, uh, have a good relationship in that we're both open and, and we're both open to cogent logical arguments. So, you know, it wasn't that we were trying to advance an agenda or a conclusion, with Body by Science, our, our position was let's assume we know nothing about this enterprise of how human beings exercise or why they should exercise or what it does. And let's look into the, the evidence uh, for this activity and see which, you know, which side of the ledger the, the evidence is, uh, comes down on. And it happened to come down quite favorably on the side of resistance training. So uh, I, like, I like Doug a lot. Uh, I still consider him probably the brightest mind in uh, the field of exercise but uh, i haven't i can't say that we've communicated a lot over the past couple of years okay. um what are you, you mentioned you just finished two books and I'm curious to know what are those books and there's a book on exercise you mentioned which sounds very interesting yeah, yeah well it started out someone had told me that um they liked some of my other books but they were too uh technical so i thought well okay i'll write out something maybe just as a something for people at the gym who maybe don't want to wade through all the academia, but um, I was dissatisfied with it. And frankly, I thought it was poorly written. So over the past five years, I've been going back at it and uh, correcting it and plugging in footnotes. If I could find a reference that supported a certain position. And, uh, and then I, I blew the whole thing up about a year ago because I thought it was just random jottings, you know, it really was pointless and you can't publish a book. Um, if you have nothing to say. And then it kind of dawned on me that, you know, the world of exercise right now is based on a faulty premise, at least I believe it is. Um, you know, sales of treadmills have never been higher. Information has never been more readily available to people via the Internet. And yet obesity levels have never been higher. Um, so there's a problem, clearly. So I believe the current paradigm is wrong. And so the first third of the book examines the popular beliefs with regard to exercise critically. And the second component of the book uh, deals with advancing a new paradigm for exercise. Um, and then the third one uh, presents some, some protocols that uh, may allow people to achieve what they can achieve from exercise without running up a lot of wear and tear uh, in the process. So, uh, at the moment, the titles, uh, are all over the board, but it'll probably be exercise, a minimalist's approach. It will be that book. And, um, the other book is on the mysterious death of a Canadian artist back in 1917. Uh, there's a bit of a family history there because, uh, my father wrote a book on the same subject back in 1970 and had done quite a bit of research into it. Uh, the artist's name was Tom Thompson. He sort of has become the face of Canadian art, but he died under very mysterious circumstances, and nobody to this day knows where his body is. Um, so anyway, my dad had met a park ranger back in 1930 who knew Tom Thompson and was there when Tom Thompson's body was first pulled from the waters of this lake. And he told my dad that, there was a fishing line wrapped 16 times around his left ankle, which raised an eyebrow and that there was a four inch bruise on his left temple. Uh, and the body was so badly decomposed that an immediate burial was a necessity. So they buried him in this little cemetery in this remote park in the province of Ontario. And the Thompson family decided they wanted the body returned to the family plot, which was about 85 miles away. And they, got an undertaker who said he would do the job. And his job then was to dig through six feet of earth, pull up this casket, 
remove this terribly decomposed body and put it into a metal casket, solder the metal casket so that there would be no odor emitted uh, when it was put on a train, and then send it to the family plot. But on the way to the cemetery, the undertaker arrived at about 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Uh, he dismissed everybody in his party and said, I'll do this alone, uh, which was rather a macabre thing. And uh, three hours later, he signaled to come and pick him up and that the job was done. But nobody believed he did the job in three hours. And certainly this park ranger didn't believe it. And he told my dad that. And in 1956, my dad and three men went up to the cemetery and dug in the area that was said to have contained or was said to have been the artist's original grave. Now they expected to find a casket because the undertaker had brought a metal casket and it was said to have reinterred the uh, existing casket that Thompson had been buried in. And they did find a casket, but they also found a body in it. So this caused a, a quite a large amount of alarm throughout Canada at the time. But uh, it was for reasons unbeknownst to anyone, um, the attorney general's office in Canada said that the bones were not that of Thompson. They were those of a native person uh, who had somehow been buried in Thompson's casket at approximately the same date, which made no sense at all. So anyway, my thought was to go through current research and, and uh, data from the archives and try and make sense of this and then present it to police detectives who have never been involved in the Thompson case and get their opinion on it. So that's what I've been working on. And that's that's almost ready, is it? To you'll be publishing that as well soon, or? Yeah, it's off at the publishers already. It's off my computer finally, so I'm happy about that. <clears throat> oh, congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so we're sort of coming towards the end, and I just wanted to, I guess, ask you a couple more questions if you've got time, John. Sure, absolutely. Cool. Um, okay, what are you really not very good at? <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty long list. How much time do you have? Uh, I'm not handy at all. Uh, oh, really? if, you put a, if you put a hammer in my hand, I wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, uh, I have friends and relatives that are contractors, and they can look at a plot of land and they can see a house. And I look at it and I see nothing but rocks and grass. So I, I lack any creative component whatsoever when it comes to building. Um if something needs uh, repairing, uh, I have zero knowledge of how to do so. Not that I couldn't learn it, but I just, for me, if I'm not really interested in the subject, I have no interest in the subject. So back when I was younger, if I was going to a party and uh, they weren't talking about Bruce Lee, I wasn't having a conversation because that's all I was interested in. When I got older, um, Mike Mentzer replaced Bruce Lee. I wanted to tell people all about Mike Mensa. And, uh, and uh, so now it's, um, you know, it's sort of the same thing. I just, I didn't develop um, an interest in just, you know, I would say practical things. Most of my knowledge is uh, impractical, if you will. It's, uh, you know, I mean, in some cases, it's knowledge about other people, Bruce Lee and Mike Mensa. I mean, how is that relevant to anything, you know, in the big picture? But, um, it did develop certain uh, skill sets that I, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't think I had, but shy of that, um, I probably would have been wise to uh, pick up a few other skills, but yeah, handyman definitely do not possess the skills. In, um, in part one, in our first uh, podcast, you mentioned how Mike would have, you know, he said he would have, if, if he could live live again, he'd invested far more, much more of his time in the kind of psychological development over the physical development domain. Um, right. How do you think he would have done that? And what knowledge do you think he'd have sought in that process? I know that's a, a, a hard question, but curious to know your thoughts. Uh, well, he told me he would have, uh, he would have become a doctor. Uh, so that would have been his priority, I think. He would have um, kept bodybuilding as part of his life, but as an adjunct to his life, uh, not the the end all, you know, be all end all. Um, so I think he would have. Uh, he was always fascinated by facts. Uh, so I think he liked med medicine for that that purpose because uh, even though our knowledge. Uh, does change in medicine. We get to learn more about certain things and thus the paradigm gets affected. You're still dealing with tangible facts. And he loved that hard knowledge. 
So I, I think uh, from speaking with him that he, he had he been given the choice to do it again, he, I think he would have completed med school, become a doctor, but would have worked out as infrequently as was necessary in order to um, uh, pay attention to his health. I'm bouncing around a little bit here, but um, I meant to ask you earlier about philosophy, which is something I'm really interested in reading more about the you know, different different um, philosophy, uh, I guess, types from different uh, philosophers. Um, what, do you have any recommendations like where to begin? Because there's obviously so much out there and it's quite intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I would uh, I would recommend Will Durant um, as your intro to philosophy. He used he, sometimes the best way is uh, um, philosophy leading by example, which is history in some respects. And Will Durant would look at uh, various philosophers' lives and he'd tell you their story. You know, it was the story of you know Nietzsche or the story of Plato, and you get these real world uh, anecdotes and then their thoughts. And he had an ability to take the most complex philosophical theorems and render them intelligible. So his book, The Story of Philosophy, is a very fascinating read. Um, after that, if you like his presentation, his book, his last book called Fallen Leaves, which I edited, is very intriguing and some of the best prose, actually, you'll ever read. Um, and at that point, you will find that one or more of the philosophers that you read about spoke to you in some way, that something resonated from what they said. At that point, follow, follow your own path there. Buy their books, look them up online, uh, read uh, you know, whatever is compelling, and it'll get you thinking. And when you get thinking, you're going to start to see applications to your own life, and you're going to understand certain things that occur in your life that heretofore may have been a little foggy. Um, and, and philosophers are great for that. At least they have been in my case. They've, they've made sense of a lot of things. It also gives you some pretty good tools. A great book called The Art of Philosophizing by Bertrand Russell. It's a very little book, but it, it's a great book for learning um, valid from invalid uh, lines of reasoning. And it's, it's, it's written for the layperson, which all good philosophy should be. And uh, I would recommend that book. Um, depending on your predilection, there are certain philosophers who will, as I mentioned, who, whose words will resonate with you. Uh, I always like Lucretius. Um, I like uh, Lao Tzu, who's the alleged author of the book, The Tao Te Ching. Um, if you like if you're a practical um, guy who likes hard answers, you'll probably gravitate towards something like objectivism. Um, Alan Watts is tremendous. I mean, he he I mean he and Will Durant I mean are great. Will Durant will, didn't really spend a lot of time on Eastern thought except for his massive story of civilization series, which is a high price to pay for a little bit of knowledge, um, but. Alan Watts was terrific. Uh, there's so much material uh, of Alan Watts online now. Uh, when I first got in Alan Watts, I used to buy cassettes and would play them in the car. So now you don't even have to do that. You can just go online and, and it's available for free. Um, shy of that, his books, Tao the Watercourse Way, Taoism, um, The Culture of Counterculture, any, any of those books would be a terrific way to start. And uh, it does give you a different perspective, which oftentimes, as Bruce Lee said, in the contrast of comparison, some new thing might grow. Do you, do you read, have you ever read much Proust? No, I can't say that I have. Okay. You mean or, Marcel? Sorry? You mean Marcel? Uh, possibly. I'm, <laughs> the reason I, I don't know that the answer to that is, um, I just I've just borrowed a book. Um, it's uh, you know Alan de Botton. I think he's a British guy, um, yes. and he 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 uh, writes about Proust. And I think it's Marcel. Is it Marcel Proust? Sorry, is that what you're? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've not read I've not read it, but I just read like the first page and thought it was quite hilarious um, initially. And I need to get back on it. Uh, have you read any any of his stuff? Any of Elaine's stuff or? I don't believe I have. I, I, for some reason, I want to think I had a book of his, but if I did, it 
uh, I either didn't get around to reading it or it didn't impact me. So I'm afraid I, I must answer in the negative there. Didn't he do a book on, I want to think, the history of philosophy or the story? And it's, yeah. If, if that's the case, I may have. But. Is that is that kind of how you operate then? So if you pick up a book or start reading it and it's just like, you, know, you, you won't kind of give it the time of day or just move on to the next. You won't be patient with it necessarily if it doesn't resonate with you, you just discard it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Because um, I wonder, you know, when uh, talking about, it, you know, there's so much information, right? And especially today, so much content created every single day that it's impossible to consume even a very small portion of it um and what's worse is a lot of it's crap right uh and a lot of it's just people you know you know mimicking someone else's message uh, and echoing someone else's message so it's like how how do you recommend people i guess acquire knowledge like in a is it is it like you say just focus on what you're really interested in because that's where you're going to have the most kind of discipline in terms of you're actually going to go deep on the subject and don't kind yeah, of force I, yourself to read stuff you don't want to read or how do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good way to do it um, because if you're not interested in it, it's very difficult to acquire a taste for it. Uh, it's like your parents standing over you wagging their finger and saying, you know, thou shalt do this. Uh, it doesn't take long before the defense barriers come up and you don't do it. Uh, but if you're passionate about it, you get it through osmosis. And I think that's – Plato once said knowledge acquired under compulsion has no hold on the mind, and I believe that's true. Um, so the best way is to go into what you like and and dig deep. You know, dig deep for all it's worth. I mean, go into it and make hay with it. Enjoy it. Um, revel in it. And learn as much as you can about it. And you're going to find, by extension, you've learned about a lot of other things – um, sub, even on a subconscious level, you've, you've picked up this uh, ancillary knowledge that uh, you may not have been looking for or have been able to articulate going into the enterprise, but it just, it's there and, and you pick it up as a matter of course. So yeah, I think you've got to go into what you are passionate about or what you're interested about. And, and there is no topic that is trivial. You know, some people say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm only interested in whatever. You know, and then it's, it's pretty low on the important scale. No, it's not. If it gives your life meaning, it's very high on the on the priority scale. And that's the only thing that matters is your life to you and the meaning that you, that you imbue it with. And these are all things that you have decided as an individual make your life something to look forward to, something worthwhile. And that's why we, you know, there's a, a diversity of interests. Uh, because we we all have different life experiences and and our interests reflect those, so it's very important that whatever it is that you're interested in, don't for a second worry whether or not someone else will think it's important. It doesn't matter what someone else thinks. Their their journey is their journey. Uh, hey, that's really good advice. Um, I want to respect your time, John. I could probably talk to you for like another three hours, but I'm sure you've got better things to do. <laughs> um, well, but so, what what is the uh, what's the best way for for people to to contact you and find out more about you these days? Find out perhaps more about the the, the most recent work you're doing. Jeez, you know, I I, um, I, know I have no selling stuff on podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> no, I really, I don't have a website. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't. I, I I used to have one when I started Max Contraction, and then I realized that as my thinking uh, changed, um, that it was. It was pretentious, and I didn't like that. So basically, I just took it down. Um, I don't know if the publisher is going to be after me to do some sort of social media thing for the book. Most likely, they will. Probably, it would be for the Tom Thompson book more so than the exercise book. So, yeah, no, there's no way to contact me and leave me the hell alone. <laughs> well well i know if you uh type in your name on amazon all of your books are there um so if you're if you're listening and you're interested in any of john's work check it out it's very easy to find um so yeah for all of uh all of those listening um to find this episode and, and all episodes in terms of all of the show notes and links and everything we mentioned all of the philosophy etc um go to 15 minute corporate warrior.com forward slash podcast that's 1515 and until next time thank you very much for listening 
I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill De Simone, on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are not verbatim, deliberately. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C-O-R-P warrior.com, and enter your email address. Then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you'll be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts.